Welcome to Computer Network Security. Today we are going to talk about Kerberos. To begin, uh, the origins of Kerberos uh, started at, uh, in a project called Project Athena uh, in MIT from 1983 to 1991. Um, it was uh, launched from a $50 million grant from uh, DEC and IBM. And it grew out of Project Athena because there was a need to secure this uh, huge campus-wide distributed computing environment uh, that was created as part of this grant. So um, Kerberos is an authentication protocol then uh, for how we can uh, secure a network. Uh, the origins of the word Kerberos actually comes from uh, Greek and Roman mythology that Cerberus was uh, the three-headed dog that guarded the gates of the underworld. And it was said that he was always employed by Hades' loyal watchdog and guarded the gates that granted access and exit to the underworld. So uh, it kind of makes sense if what's happening is that we're trying to protect access and authentication to a network, uh, that it would be called something uh, along the lines of uh, Cerberus, which is Kerberos. Here are some of the design goals of Kerberos. Um, it must be secure, can't be circumvented. Packet sniffing, replay attack should not be able to be used to uh, break the security. It has to be reliable. Uh, access to many services depend on this authentication service. It should be transparent to the user uh, after the initial login. So it was okay if it wasn't transparent at first, as long as it was transparent to the user uh, after that initial login and uh, it needs to be scalable. Um, anytime that you're dealing with networks, it's always good to make sure that your, uh, that your protocols are scalable as you add more and more nodes to it. Okay, authentication versus authorization. We've talked about this a little bit in the past. Authentication is the mechanism uh, where systems may securely identify their users. They answer who's the user and is the user really who he says he is. Uh, authorization, on the other hand, uh, is how a system determines what level of access a particular authenticated user should have uh, to specific resources that are controlled by the system, such as, is this user authorized to access this resource? Is the user authorized to perform some operation? Is the user authorized to perform this operation on some resource? So uh, this is the distinction between authentication and authorization. The Kerberos server um, only performs read-only operations on the database. The database holds the name and encrypted private key for every client and server on the network. This is important to note. The Kerberos database holds the name and, and encrypted private key for every client and server on the network. Now, we could have uh, replicated servers. We don't want to necessarily have a single point of failure if that server ever goes down. So we do have... Uh, we can have replicated uh, databases uh, on the network um, if we need, where they contain only read-only copies of the database, so they can't update any of the data, but uh, they could contain read-only uh, copies of the database. So this is one of the uh, scalability measures that are built into Kerberos. Um, and only the master database is allowed to be modified, and then the master database distributes it to the slaves. Let me point out uh, something. A number of the slides in this lecture are coming from uh, this paper that you see at the bottom referenced by Steiner, Newman, and Schiller. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the, uh, this, is, this is the paper that defined Kerberos, so it's a great paper. It's one that you should probably make sure that you really focus on and uh, read, make sure that you understand uh, this paper uh, primarily out of the other papers that are posted for this lecture. Okay, Kerberos tickets are valid for a single client-server pair. They contain the server name, the client name, and the IP address, uh, the timestamp, a lifetime, and a random session key. And they can continue, the client can continue using uh, that Kerberos ticket um, until the session expires. Um, so a client authenticates on a specific server, can continue accessing that server uh, using this ticket, which is a client-server pair. Um, with this information inside of it uh, until the ticket expires, so for uh, whatever the time period is for that. This is generated by the Kerberos server, uh, and... Okay, so how do we go about 
acquiring an initial ticket. So we know the Kerberos server. So we're sitting at our computer. We say, hi, um, Mr. Kerberos server. Send us some information. Kerberos server says, do I know this person? And he says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this person. All right, here's your ticket. And he sends this ticket back, which had the information that we saw on the previous slide. Once we have that, it says, okay, enter your password. Uh, we enter our password. We convert that, and that results in this uh, ticket that was sent back to us. So from that, using our password from the ticket and the password, we now have, uh, are able to access the server that we would like to uh, get in touch with. So now we have that. Uh, that key. Um, the ticket is only valid for one interaction with the server. It contains the client name, workstation, and the workstation time. So if we want to request a service uh, through the authenticator, we send this over to our ticket granting server. Uh, the server then decrypts the ticket uh, with its own ticket granting server key and extracts the session key. And then it starts comparing the client name, the IP, the time, uh, and uh, the uh, other information from the ticket and uh, sends us some information back authenticating us. So that's how we request a service. Um, again, make sure that you read this paper. It goes into great detail about this process. I've tried to simplify it as much as possible so that you can understand uh, what is going on here. What does Kerberos do? It provides a mean for the server and client to authenticate one another. It doesn't provide authorization, it's just doing authentication. It uses symmetric encryption, allows for single sign-on. Uh, if there's multiple servers, it could allow for a single sign-on process to take, uh, take effect there. User passwords are never transmitted over the network. Okay, so here is uh, another diagram from one of the other papers that we have posted for uh, this lecture, talking about how Kerberos works and how you can request services uh, from a specific server. It goes through steps one, two, and three there. It explains it in this paper uh, by few and do. So please take a look at that paper as well. There are three uh, levels of authentication provided by Kerberos. One of them is just that initiation of the connection. Uh, the next one is for each message. This is called safe messages. And the third one um, encrypts each message, and this would be called private messages. There have been a number of versions of Kerberos. First uh, three versions were internal to Project Athena, and then version 4 was the first version where the source code was released to the public. Uh, there were a few errors in that, few bugs, so version 5 was released, um, and it version 4 was using DES. Uh, version 5 uses triple DES, uh, which makes it a little bit more secure. We've uh, talked about that a little bit. Uh, from some of our previous lectures, and it also resolved uh, an overflow attack vulnerability that we had uh, in version 4. Okay, uh, the paper reference at the bottom pointed out a few of the existing problems that we have with Kerberos. Uh, there's, um, if there is a single Kerberos server, then we do have a single point of failure. And uh, with networking, we often try to make sure that we do not have a single point of failure. Uh, we can have these duplicate servers that we talked about earlier. Uh, keeping those up to date requires transmitting the username and key combinations over the network though. And this is something that we were trying not to do. It's something that we don't currently do uh, in Kerberos if we don't have these duplicate servers. So it makes it a little more secure that we're never transmitting any of these passwords or uh, these uh, combinations over the network. Um, since there is a single server that has all of this data, then we have a single server that we have uh, that can be hacked into, and then all of the keys are exposed. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing because if we have this in more than one place, then it provides more vulnerabilities to uh, grab the keys. Uh, we lack undeniability in digital signatures. Uh, this is uh, often a problem that we don't know if somebody has access to uh, the Kerberos server. We're prone to dictionary attack. If enough tickets are collected, uh, we'll talk more about different types of attacks. The dictionary attack is where you just go through uh, all of the tickets that you have and see if they match different dictionary words. One of the reasons why passwords often will uh, not be allowed to have uh, dictionary words involved in them.
and time requirements cause frequent authentication failures. If the session is set to be very, very short, uh, then you will have to re-authenticate frequently. And uh, the uh, older versions use DES 56-bit encryption. This can be changed to using triple DES, as we just saw on uh, an earlier slide, though. So uh, some solutions, uh, even moving away from triple DES and moving up to uh, a form of RSA called Fast RSA, uh, which utilizes a, a theorem called the Chinese Remainder Theorem. If you don't know that uh, theorem, um, you might have covered that in a discrete math class, but if you don't, take a look at that. It's kind of an interesting theorem, something that you should probably know. Uh, asymmetric keys would be good to use uh, so that the Kerbero server can hold public keys instead of actually holding the uh, symmetric private keys. Uh, and then we can bump up the encryption to 1024, 2048, 4096, uh, something just uh, to increase the encryption that we have. Um, we can also replace the timestamps with random numbers that would probably help with some of the different attacks that can take place uh, based on timestamp. If uh, you are wondering if you've ever used Kerberos, the answer is most likely yes. Um, Kerberos is built into most uh, major operating systems, Windows, uh, OS X, Mac, uh, a couple different flavors of Linux and Unix, uh, Blackberry, so uh, possibly even on smartphones uh, that utilize it. Xbox Live uses it also. So there are, uh, it is very, very popular, very widely used. Um, how do you get your own Kerberos system? Well. Uh, since this is an encryption protocol, it's important that uh, for the U.S. government that it is not being uh, exported to uh, countries with which the U.S. is not friendly. So as long as uh, you are not residing or from any of those countries, then you can go to uh, MIT's website. You can actually get a distribution of Kerberos. You can uh, even get the source code. It is open source. So you can see exactly how it runs um, and uh, even go through the code. There's the URL. Uh, in my, at MIT's website uh, that you can get that. So, uh, I know that I have covered uh, Kerberos, which is a very, very large topic in a very short amount of time. Please take the time to read through uh, at least the primary Kerberos paper, uh, and then also take a look at some of the supplementary papers that are posted. Alright, I'll talk with you all soon.